I did mention that you were one of the important person responsible for me starting this course. And, good, uh, good. You, and, I, and it took you 10 years. <laughs> 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 and, uh, well, it, it, you know, uh, so many things happen. And uh, finally I realized that, uh, you know, we need a course like this. And uh, when I still look at, um, you know, sometimes the education system and what students learn and what they don't learn, I think there's a missing link like yourself. You, you're a well keen on educator providing the orthodontics, which is, uh, you know, such an important uh, link in dentist education. And doesn't matter what stage in their career. Uh, you have shown, uh, you know, you've created a lot of results in terms of, uh, I think I would say you're probably the pioneer in Australia on, the, on this area of postgraduate education. Um, I think that's quite impressive to be honest with you. So uh, I'll learn a lot from you. I'll learn a lot from you in terms of how you teach and uh, how you put things together. And, um, uh, and uh, I know that you've, uh, one day you said you're going to put a course together. And it's going to be something about prosthodontics and aesthetics. So, because I mean, in, in the orthodontic space, there's a lot of uh, good structured programs, but it, it seemed to be that in your field, very ad hoc stuff, weekend stuff, a bit here, a bit there. So, um, putting together something that was approved by Ediqual, that in itself is a huge feather in your cap because yeah. then it's, uh, you know, it's telling you that you're, um, the people who run postgraduate education in the UK have certified this um, to a, a very high level. And I think, I don't think people in Australia quite understand Ediqual, but your Ediqual 7 is the equivalent to um, Australian Standards 8, which is a um, higher than a bachelor's. So it's a postgraduate diploma. People always don't get that. Yeah. It was a quite a, a stringent process to go through. To yeah. prove that uh, they can approve. A lot of people do try to do this and actually they fail. Uh, it's not that simple. Yeah. Uh, so in, in many ways, I find uh, uh, when we present the course program, uh, it was interesting to know that uh, uh, after about uh, three to six months, uh, I was able to uh, I was able to gain their uh, confidence and trust, and uh, so that was something very very important. Uh, you know, to me, I thought this is it. That's what we want people to do, and uh, put the program. Uh, Ask a few of the colleagues, yourself as well, and what they think. Been for a lot of changes. I saw a lot of my colleagues, also general practitioners, what you really want to learn. And it's interesting to know that they don't know a lot of different areas. But the hardest thing is connecting the dots. So they go to two day seminar here and then seminar here. But how do I actually think? You know, like a thinking yeah. is a precious commodity. Like they don't know what to do. But you just say, well, which way do I go about this case? And I think in many ways, uh, that's what I thought was uh, the important part of bridging that gap in dental education. And, you know, and I teach from my heart and I know you do the same. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think you mentioned once during our interview, we have an actual release of interviews that where you said that when a, there's a light bulb effect when a student learns exactly what the, you know, the concept is. You yeah. might want to talk about that because I think, you know, you have so much experience in this area. What, what you're doing here in this program is allowing a student to have a number of specialists look at their case because we all look at cases with different eyes. I mean, this case tonight will be an example. Yeah. I'll put on my orthodontic thinking hat. You put on your uh, aesthetic dentistry restorative implant hat. Many looks at the um, prognosis of those root filled teeth. Uh, what great opportunity uh, to do this multiplicity planning. I remember, I always remember when I was in dental school, you could never have a patient on a multidisciplinary clinic. So if you had a patient that needed pros, um, perio and endo, you'd have to reappoint that patient three times in the three different clinics because back then they, they didn't get multidisciplinary treatment, right? Um, and I think we're all treating more and more adults now who have... Um, fairly high aesthetic expectations. Uh, in my field, something like Invisalign has marketed directly to the consumer. So now a lot of adults are coming out of the woodwork saying, hey, we'd like to get our teeth straightened. But then you look in their mouth and you've got Pandora's box, you know, yeah. and without specialists like yourself and Medi and uh, our periodontal team, it's, 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 a, it's um, a bit of a minefield just to start the orthodontics. So I think that's, it's good what you're doing here. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm waiting for many to come on board. And uh, the, 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 the other problem that I find uh, Laura should like to know, we did a quick lecture, I think a week and a half or two weeks ago, and it was interesting to know their response to, to, the, to the, what I was talking about. And we talked about simple things like a toothware, you know. I mean, toothware, everyone, you know, treats toothware, it's present. But I find that for general practitioners to understand in terms of the management and uh, toothware and treatment of toothware was, uh, was uh, like for them, it's a very simple process. And yet, when you really sit down and think about the process of toothware, how you look at the patient's lifetime, it's a totally different thing. You know, we don't treat patients at that one point in their lives. We treat them for the whole life, you know, as long as we around there, around them, you want the other one to continue. I mean, how often do we get patients who comes in with, with their dentists and have a great dentistry done and suddenly the dentist retires and they're completely lost, like they don't know where to go. And they get, you know, you can just see their mouth and know the whole history of what's happened. I say, who was this dentist who did treat here? He's some really, you know, like an old fashioned guy who really did a great dentistry had a great health and the patients left for like 10 years, 20 wonderful dentists and dentists. Yeah. And I thought, you know, this course will give the dentist that extra uh, confidence, also the passion to do the best dentistry and then be very successful. I've proven this over some of the colleagues in my, in my, uh, in, in the faculty, uh, and they mentioned Isadora who've actually been taught by me and, uh, they have continued a very successful multi-million dollar practices by doing simple things, not just complicated things. You know, mm, mm. there's a consensus to complicate things. And because it's complicated, somehow better. And you and I know how we try to break it down and make it simple. Because simple is predictable, don't you think so? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, this is what we're learning. Uh, we got 50 people coming up, so I think uh, we can start. Kevin, what do you think? Oh, wait, another few minutes. Um, I just spoke to Dr. Mehdi. He's running about a couple of minutes late. All so right, we'll, wait for him, yeah. we'll wait for a couple of minutes and then. Oh, oh yes, yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, that's excellent. And uh, so, you know, I put these 12 uh, modules together. And I think uh, at the end of the day, the students will learn how to be confident. And also, the other thing is with, with Derek, with I find is you probably found in your, uh, in your education process where they're joining a really good team of clinicians. Like how often do I get an email from you? Oh, I recommend Sarkis once you get in to have a look at this case, right? Doesn't matter which part of the world. And you know that when you recommend somebody, I get on and I just immediately respond to you and to your colleague. You know, we save the day for our colleagues. Yeah. Like you do this yeah. every day. I mean, you know, and uh, there's other stuff that we have to write things and try to help the situation. But we're really here to look after our colleagues, aren't we? Correct, correct. And unfortunately... Uh, I saw in DPR, uh, you know, everyone's complaining about their, uh, what do you call it, indemnity insurance fees skyrocketing. Yeah. And, you know, you, you can thank the profession for that. You know how many of our colleagues just want to throw people under the bus? It just oh. sickens me when I get involved in medical legal stuff. And you think anyone can make a mistake. Uh, no one has perfect records on the day. But to just get crucified by some of these so-called ivory tower specialists, it's just terrible. And um, I think this is a good thing. And, you know, if, you, if there's a young dentist out there who's about to start a complex case, how good is it to say, right, before I started this case, I sought the opinion from an orthodontist, a periodontist, a prosthodontist. This is what they suggested. And this is why I started the treatment. And um, that's very, very hard then to uh, knock that case as far as um, was this beyond your scope of practice? Is it something you shouldn't have done? But it just, it just saddens me that our profession doesn't stick up for each other. It doesn't. I, so, I, I think the other thing you brought mentioned to me, and just coming back on the steps in those legal cases, you know very well that when you look at the diagnosis and treatment planning, without good diagnosis, whole treatment planning is just completely outside, right? So yeah. if people are missing things, like I've got a case at the moment, this is cut 25 year old girl, okay, cosmetic guy, guru, cut from one end to the other. She got sick root therapist, missed the perigonal infection on one six, place the crown, and how you how do you look after so What do you say? You know what I mean? Like I say, I just don't want to touch this case. I just look, I'm not I'm interested. So you try to help them. But if there's a little point where there's a thought process and you know there was a thinking about it, you want to pick it up and expand it, you don't want to try and fix the case stuff. That's basically what we like to do. Hmm. I notice I see I see Chin Nguyen's name. Is that the uh, Peter Dantas Chin Nguyen? 
I don't know whether you can hear us or not. He's another guy you should invite to uh, to chat. He's very, very good with um, wow. you know those complex syndromal cases with kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I love to invite him, and it's wonderful to have him on. We should do a uh, we should do a, for instance uh, on a hypodontia case with a pediatric dentist. It'd be wonderful to have. Him. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Or you know, it's a really good multidisciplinary thing to talk about. Yes. Um, uh, MIH and bombed out sixes oh. because what I find that's happening these kids are like seven or eight and without any multidisciplinary planning these kids just go to GA and and, and wake up with uh, 1200 standard steel crowns in the mouth um, and then what happens when they come to me for ortho at 12 or 13 uh. you know I've got to open the discussion hey what is the long-term prognosis of these four first molars that are, have got standard steel crowns yeah. are you eventually going to restore them with normal crowns did anyone give the option of removing them and closing the space by the sevens and yeah. the thing that the parents say no no it was just the kid had sensitive teeth we were recommended by a dentist to see the periodontist and bang next thing you know uh, uh it, it, it's all done so i, I think that's a, a case that would be a good topic oh, sure. you know how do you multidisciplinary plan uh bombed out sixes i mean i've had so many cases where i would have suggested hey don't worry about standard steel crowns just do some patch up to get them out of pain until you get vocation of the seven and pop those sixes. That's and those right. sevens erupt really well in most of the cases. And you save the kid from, you know, like for me, it's really hard when they're 12 or 13 to take out the six and have to bodily bring a seven forward. These are the discussions that- and you got wisdom pitfalls at the same time. You got wisdom pitfalls, you're not impacting them. Yeah, the whole yeah. Time. yeah, correct, correct. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, this is all about, you know, even, especially the colleges to consult each other to make sure that for a long-term outcome of the patient, which is a simple picture. We do this on, uh, together on a hypodontia case. You know, that's hypodontia right, that's right. Missing yeah. teeth. Yeah. You know, the, the more complex the hypodontia is now we're missing teeth, it's how complex is to plan those cases. And, there you go. And, uh, oh, yeah, okay. I see, I see Medi's. I see Medi there, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, welcome aboard, Medi. Where are you? <laughs> now, those of you who have joined us, thank you for joining us. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Hi, Maddie. How are you? Uh, uh, and uh, may Maddie, I ask maybe, you? maybe turn your camera on, Maddie. I'll just switch this lights off so I can see better. Are you there, Maddie? Well, I'll, 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 I'll proceed. Uh, uh, those of you who have joined us, thank you for joining us. This is a webinar 14. And uh, in, in many ways, um, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to have my very good colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Mahoney. Sorry, guys. Just... That's okay. And Mehdi Rahimi, who are my exclusive specialist colleagues. I basically work with them on a daily basis. Uh, orthotic cases treated by Derek. And we have a monthly system planning. And uh, I have, we have a paradox on board. He's not in. That's um, Esa Malati. Uh, and also I understand what else is as well. But, uh, you know, we have regularly, I will ask Medi to give me, uh, you know, prognosis of the entire dentition in terms of which way it's going to go. And, uh, and then before Derek does his work, we look at the whole thing and then we decide which way we're going to treat, treat this patient. So uh, without much ado, uh, we had a discussion about multidisciplinary planning, Medi. I mean, I'm, I knew you were busy joining us. So um, let me go proceed next stage. And uh, we, we spoke about this case, this female, 35 years of age, presented with probe anesthetics uh, and is not happy with the actual bridge work. There's a lot of other issues. And during this seminar, we'll talk about on a comprehensive discussion and look at all the others of diagnosis and triple options, short and long term. So it'll be quite interesting. We have about a good 50, 55 slides to go through. So that should be interesting time to spend in terms of looking at the options. And I'll probably ask you a couple of questions later on to see the important part of the whole planning of this case. Nevertheless, uh, we, have, we have seen this and uh, we've uh, got the next stage. Is a very elegant and beautiful patient. Uh, initially, the patient referred to me by Dr. Derek Mahoney. And uh, I work with Derek all the time. And uh, I think Derek is one of the very few, if not the only one, who understands the concept of and practices the concept of multidisciplinary planning. So you can see the problem. 
And we know there's a lot of problems. It will come later on and discuss this later on. But nevertheless, um, uh, you know, you can see the, um, you know, the images that I'm presenting. I mean, Derek, you might want to have a few few comments you want to say on this. Yeah. Part. So this um, this uh, beautiful young lady uh, was referred to me by her general dentist. Um, uh, she wanted an improvement in the aesthetics of her smile. When I looked at her OPG, I realized she was congenitally missing her laterals, um, but the previous work that had been done um, overseas uh, was basically uh, a resin bonded bridge, which where the gingival margins of the pontics uh, the, uh, for the, uh, the laterals were nowhere close to the gingival margins of the centrals. Then those centrals had a history of trauma. Uh, the, the roots were not parallel. Uh, they'd been previously root filled. So I thought this is um, very important. We get an opinion from my prosthodontist. Uh, and I always say to a patient when they say, well, why are you sending me to another specialist? Uh, I thought you're the guy. That's why my dentist referred you to me. And I like using analogies uh, that patients understand. And um, I said, look, if you're building a house, uh, you have this house in mind and it's beautiful, but if the foundations are no good, it's a waste of time. So that's why many architects will work with structural engineers. And she said, oh, yeah, I get that. So I said, right, well, Sarkis is my structural engineer. Before I move your teeth, I need to have an endpoint in mind. You know, we all need to um, agree on the end result. And uh, as those people who may or may not know Sarkis, uh, he has attention to detail doing direct composite mock-ups. And, you know, although I love DSD and I have a lot of um, uh, patients that undergo that, there's nothing better than doing it in someone's mouth and then they can look in a mirror and say, yep, that's what I'm signing up for. Because then I don't have any ego on my face when I start orthodontics. And, um, and then uh, they say, oh, no, 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 I didn't think that was what I was after, et cetera, et cetera. So really the plan in this lady's case was to... Um, uh, uh, give her less protrusion because she found it very hard to get lip competence. And you can see in the photos here uh, where she is got her lips together, that, that you can see the strain on mentalis, right? So she's a bit bidental protrusive, number one. Number two, her main concern, which is aesthetics, um, really cannot be done just by me because at the end of the day, yeah. I, don't, I don't have laterals to move. If I had laterals to move, I would possibly consider intruding them uh, to, um, uh, to match the gingival uh, margin more. Uh, you can see this lady has her centrals, her pontic laterals, and her canines all at different gingival margins, which automatically is uh, um, a bit of a red herring for her uh, end result. Uh, you couple with that the trauma that she's sustained on her incisors. Um, and, you know, we really have a classic multidisciplinary treatment. So it was great to get Medi's input on this case uh, on the incisors. It was great to get Sarkis's end result. And with that in mind, I was happy then to proceed uh, with the uh, orthodontic care. Does that make sense um, to the audience and to, to, I mean, Sarkis, how do you run these webinars? Do can people oh, okay. I have Natasha. It's, I have Natasha who's going to take all the yeah. all the questions that are coming in, and yeah. then as they come in, she'll ask. But one thing, while you you all you mentioned, um, Derek, the biggest problem we had for this patient was uh, we'll talk about the diagnostic mock-up. And thank you very much because I think diagnostic mock-ups is extremely important. We teach this at the college. It's actually colleges. A lot of workers at the college, especially students, who learn how you actually teach them directly how to do this. Is very important. I think today's students have lost the art of diagnostic wax and they've lost the art of doing full dentures. They don't know how to put it together. So digitally, it's just, there's no near to the real life, real, real smile design, and we'll come to that. Uh, what I noticed when I first spoke to her, and I'll, I'll just go to the next one. Let's just look at this patient for a dynamic format. Let's make a talk a little bit. I'm just gonna make a talk. Very good. And then look up in the sky. Oh, you oh, can oh, see how it is. Uh, uh, like slowly, you can rotate with this so I look at all the areas, right? Yeah, like more, more I, more I like to look at a dynamic great. smile, which is very fun. So I like to look at a smile in dynamic format because static smile doesn't tell me anything. So all the patients will have a video recording of their speech and their smile dynamics and the whole thing, how the whole dental, dental complex translates in a dynamic format to the face, to the facial aesthetics. This is crucial to looking at a patient with dynamic form. 
So, you know, nobody walks around with their chick to track the likes you see me on the left, but people actually have a smile. So you got to make sure that with Derek and we thought, how do we put this whole thing together? So at the end of the day, looks right. Now, when we go back, uh, this, this, this X-ray, that's the OPG Derek. And you can obviously see that there's a, a cantilever bridge in the centrals and a very poorly maintained root canal therapy. Now, before I ask the question, maybe I've got two things to so ask the audience to come into that conversation. And uh, the question would be, is that uh, we had multiple failed bridge work, uh, that's two support bridge work. Uh, you know, why? Why there would be multiple, multiple failed bridge work? Patient says the bridge almost fell apart, they had to put it together. Every time somebody else came in, they said promise with the world, but the same problem occurred and my teeth got weaker and weaker. Could someone answer me? I've count. just got I've yeah. just got some responses, Dr. Sarkis. Go ahead. Um, perhaps trauma from occlusion. Trauma from occlusion. Okay, what else? That's all I've got at the moment. I'll as they come in, I'll let you know. All right. Well, I would probably say that could be responsible, but in many ways, the whole design is very poor. It's unretentive. You know, the 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 planning is very very poor because they haven't thought about the long-term outcome of this patient. And uh, when we think about this patient, for instance, and uh, if you know, a lot of you consider looking at some, doing some sort of implants, and uh, I will probably do the CT scans, and you can see there's a 4.34 millimeter enough length and then same on the other side. Uh, and you think, well, uh, maybe, maybe you can do a single crown for this patient, and maybe then we can do the implants for this patient. And if I recall, Derek Pesha did come in with that notion. Is that correct? In the yeah, so, so the million dollar question here was, was there enough bone there mm -hmm. uh, to put implants in? And if we are going to put implants in, then the movement of those centrals would be vastly different for me to where they are now because clearly uh, their actual uh, inclination was incorrect. So yeah. that's why I wanted your input on what you felt was the prognosis um, if we're going implants versus we're going a new bridge. Secondly, where would you like um, to me to move the, uh, the teeth uh, for canine guidance uh, for a number of other factors? Keeping in mind that um, although she was very gummy, um, that wasn't a big concern for her, right? So automatically that put her out of the surgical realm. If she came in to me and said, look, all I don't like is the amount of gum I show from molar to molar, then a whole different demographic. But here uh, uh, it was all about the, the teeth and how they didn't line up and whether she was sick of these bridges failing and someone had told her, well, implants last longer than bridge work. That's really where the discussion started. That's interesting, very interesting. And you know, you know how I feel sometimes when people say we're going to do implants here because I look at other factors. Now, this other CT scan across the centrals where the, the, the actual uh, crowns are retaining, retainers are of the bridge work. And uh, uh, did you, does anyone see anything? I mean, when we talk about you know, risk assessment and uh, we go into the area of risk assessment, I mean, why do I need a risk assessment? I mean, why, why would someone ask the question, why am I taking a scan of, of a, uh, in a sagittal image, cross-sectional cross image of the centrals? We talk about the laterals, there's a, you know, maybe there's a bone, maybe there's not, but why would I go ahead and look at the central? Would someone explain that to me? If you don't, that's fine, but I'm happy. I'll come back to this later on because you can see uh, the concept of what am I thinking before we even contemplate any treatment plan for this patient. For instance, you know, look at the patient factors, okay? I'm doing risk assessment, I'm gonna look at the x-rays, I'm looking at the patient, I wish this would help, as Derek explained. Okay, is there a function, parafunction? Is there a tooth fracture? I mean, why did the bridge fail multiple times? And then we want to know the loss of history, was there congenital missing? And I accept that, okay? Uh, you know, the letters are missing, the old hygiene, vitality, the perichar, the attached letters. I mean, I need to know the full mouth before I even think about doing this anterior, you know, treating this anterior study zone. Because it's the whole trip you need to think about, not just looking at, you know, the bridge. I can fix it, I can do better, I'm better. It's not something that you need to think about that. So look at the occlusion, look at the amount of bone, the density of the bone, the angulation of the bone, 
Now, this is a very interesting. I mean, this sort of socket that holds this tube is only about two to three percent of the population. I can tell you, so it's a bell shaped socket. So, what Kant classifies as a type four alveolus, which is basically a very complex case. And, uh, and uh, you know, do we need to change the occlusion? I'm thinking about orthodontics. So, there's a lot of things coming in my mind, not just looking at changing the bridge. But then again, I want to look at the patient factors. And uh, here's this beautiful patient. I mean, there, she's a delightful lady, you know, and uh, she's symmetrical face, look at the, you know, the cheekbones, the lips, the face, and looking at, you know, her main concern is, as you can see that, uh, you know, I mean, what I feel is that, what do you think, in your opinion, is the, the main concern for this patient? Can someone give me this answer, please? What is the main concern for the patient? I've just got some suggestions on here. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, looking at the uneven gum margins, we want to make sure where the buccal plate is, thin or thick biotype, bone loss pattern, whether it's horizontal or angular, the occlusion and bruxism. Okay, but understand that and I accept that. It's very well said. Uh, it's, it's, it's still a recipe, but I really want to ask the question Okay, and I accept that by the way. What is a patient's, patient's concern? Forget about what's in there. What is this patient's concern? Um, there's also longer to one. A gummy smile could be the patient's concern okay. as well. One word. Can someone give me one word? That's all I want. Smart. Uh, failing restorations is another suggestion. Okay, the, the word I'm looking for is aesthetics. Aesthetics defines all those things you were explaining to me. Patient's concern is aesthetics, okay? And the most important thing is for her is to look normal. She has a fish, she looks right. She's very pretty girl, very pretty girl, okay? We can talk about the lateral, the other centers, but her main concern is aesthetics. So when you talk to this patient, uh, and when I diagnose this patient, as Derek mentioned, she's a biomax or bioprotrusive, mentally bioprotrusive, and a uh, uh, high angle, you know, jawbone, and the upper and lower teeth are on the show. So, in other words, she's concerned that, you know, whatever we do to this patient would be on the show. You can't hide it behind the lips. So, whatever we do, when we commit a treatment for this patient, we need to think ahead, ahead because that's the important part of our treatment planning. And we need to also explain to the patient which direction we need to go. And so in many ways, when we look at the patient, for instance, uh, and now what are we trying to say? She's a borderline vertical mandibular excess and but because a gum, she's, not, she's uncomfortable with the gum, she's just the asymmetry she's concerned. So she's, you know, does not need the orthodox surgery. Now we asked Dr. Mehdi to come in and look at the prognosis one one and one and two one, okay? And uh, and uh, I'll ask you this question later. Would you place implants at these two sides? And I'll I want you to think about this question because it's not a tricky question, but it's some question I need to think about asking. Because before we ask this question, I'm gonna uh, okay. We need to ask specific risk factors. So let's talk about the risk factors. Now, does you want to mention the initial? Areas that our colleagues mentioned about the risk, the, the factors. I mean, what was the risk factors? They mentioned about the biotype, and I would I would go and say the following, for instance. Okay, I will say, uh, you know, unrealistic aesthetic demands. Would that be possible? I would say we should say yes, because uh, we don't really know which way this patient is going to go. You know, patient is very apprehensive which way it's going to go, so she doesn't know what to expect. These are complex patients and we need to hold these patients, not just from treatment wise, but also emotionally, so that they feel comfortable to proceed with the treatment. It's not simply mechanistic approach to the treatment. You have a smile line, okay? It's a vertical mesoexcess type one, okay? And again, there's a lip asymmetry, all right? There's a gum asymmetry. Again, there's a longer phase, logical cephalic, in a bimetrude, bimax lip protrusion, you got thin. So if every risk factor that we are thinking about is basically there. Okay, and we have angular, you know, alveolus. So uh, uh, when we think about this, when we think about this, there's also horizontal bone loss. 
where do you think with the horizontal bone or some that's really worrying me will someone help me and tell me where is my main point of concern as i look at future in this treatment any any anyone any answer please just so i know you're on the same track Any questions, any answers? Many, many, how look Okay, you have to mute because other, you have to mute. How unmute Salikita Sat? How come you like for? Okay, all right. Uh, Kevin, you might have to mute. All right, so let's just think about this. So we are missing compromised 1 1 and 2 1. So the question I will be asking our patient is that I really don't know what I'm going to find when I look at those bridges. So you cannot promise the patient anything until you have an idea what's happening inside, okay, under those crowns. So, you know, occlusion factors are always unfavorable. And therefore, when I'm thinking about this, okay, I got a high smile line, okay, I have a position of the wrists that are a little bit different, okay and mostly mostly okay we have an even smile line the the direction of the two one is extremely uh, distal and it's probably more labial so uh, my aim would be to consider to consider uh, the importance of the end point in position so we have root field teeth uh, and uh, we have a problem with trying to correct this as much as possible. And also the fact that what I need to think is that which way, which way, we, how are we going to temporize this while endodontic treatment is being uh, considered and also while the orthodontic treatment is being considered. So this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, how do I make sure that we have the right outcome, okay, the right position, and how do I design the final restoration in my occlusal prescription. Having said that for this patient, we have structural compromise 1-1 one, one, and 2-1, okay? So I'm thinking in terms of how do we play? Okay, treatment sequence. And now we have stabilized control, so the oral hygiene is all maintained, the gums are fine, it's been evaluated. You're gonna go diagnostic phase. So diagnostic phase is very critical in terms of initial diagnosis before the orthodontics, because Derek wants to know where is the end point position of the teeth if we've got definite treatment and naturally we've got a maintenance program. So we talked about that wise people know how to bend the rules. So we have to think about, do we really need implants? That's another thing to talk about. So Derek mentioned about diagnostic mock-up. It's about when we do diagnostic mock-up, it's about planning, it's about um, uh, carrying on and allowing to uh, create the effect. I have what's required to get the special effect of building the smile line, building the arch form, where I feel is going to look okay for this patient. And again, it takes a bit of time, but you can see that patients very much comfortable, very much at ease in, in this treatment process because you know, in many ways, when you do this direct mock-up and we teach at the college, we teach you how to think, how to apply your knowledge in assessing the patient directly. And that's very important. Now, we can scan this, then we do digital, whatever you need to do. But, you know, Derek will go and do reverse engineering of this mock-up. We'll come back to it later and he will explain it more. But then what we do, here's our diagnostic mock-up. You can see that we've improved the position of the teeth by adding bits and pieces of composite. But look at the patient's eyes and they're very, very confident. They feel very comfortable. And, and we sort of go to the next stage um, before I introduce my colleagues, but I will just play this for you. So it's good. It's the first time that someone takes the time to actually show me what the final result can be mm -hmm. before they always just get in a chair and then just Get it done, mm -hmm. and then I come out and I'm like, oh, oh I have to like it. And if I didn't like it, I'll just go home cry, and then in a few months go to another doctor and do different treatment. Mm -hmm. Keeps all your baby because you're beautiful. Thank you. You're fantastic. <laughs> and and uh, you can see uh, different angles. All right. 
Rotate, rotate, all that. Keep going, so, going, anyway, going, going, going. so what we have is a Pesha's approval here. And then we proceed based on my diagnosis and mock up to the approval crowns. And the patient makes a point, they're happy with it. Um, so and these are temporary crowns before the patient goes off the medic. All right. Really happy with the way the temporary looks. Mm -hmm. And naturally, now Dr. Medi, the stage is yours. We send yeah. the patient Dr. Medi. So essentially for this one, one and two, one, um, two, one, I knew that the, uh, for, for you, very important to keep, but uh, some of the issues that I had with um, both teeth. Um, so when I went into these teeth and when I f first pre-op assessed, a few things I saw, for example, tooth two, one, previous endonic therapy had gone off center because they'd used probably hand files. Mm -hmm. So they then hadn't followed the curvature there were some lesions, so I was doubting whether by just um, orthograde treatment, I'm able to achieve what I need to. Um, in terms of structure, um, especially the one one, somebody had gone off center and gutted out the tooth. I'm not sure whether they attempt to internally, internally bleach the tooth or whether it was actually um, somebody going off center because the teeth were off, off center anyway. So they've done a standard access, realized they can't find the root canal system. And you can sort of see the dark um, in the pre-op, the, the sort of the dark um, area in the access is where they gutted the tooth out. So um, there were no cracks. I trans illuminated um, both teeth and there was enough, if you like, ferrule effect. And because uh, some periodontal bone loss had occurred previously, uh, I'm not sure whether the teeth had crown lengthening in the past or not, uh, or whether just there was natural bone loss around these teeth um, due to biotype um, or thin biotype. So what, what I decided to do is um, when I took the temporaries off Sarkis, mm -hmm. um, I saw no reason there to spend two visits at these teeth. I went for it. I saw no, no cracks and I saw no reason to leave um, um, uh, intracranial medicament because it would have been hard to, you know, retemporize. So I did oh. single, visit, single visit and doing therapy on one, one, two, one. I placed fiber posts because we needed these posts to reduce the risk of fracture at gingival level. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the posts weren't really to retain the core. Um, they may have had some effect on retention of core. They just added a bit more fiber or reinforcement in them mid root region due to um, these teeth being gutted out. And I placed uh, the core work and I referred to you immediately. I think within a day, day the same, and the next day. No, same day, she came to you morning. Same she day. Came morning. I did temporaries, went to you, then she returned in the afternoon. I bonded, uh, placed the temporaries back in the mouth. Yeah, so you, you, you done the temporaries on the same day, which um, yeah. meant cosmetically she's, um, not worse off and there's less risk of uh, temporaries breaking off during the treatment and things leaking. Um, so that's what I chose to do with, and I actually do that with many um, anterior teeth where I need to do multiple anterior teeth. I just spend one visit at those teeth. And, and this is where single visit treatment comes in handy. I don't do single visit for every case, um, but I select my cases. So if I'm treating a patient like this, definitely single visit means easier temporization throughout the process. And I Absolutely. don't think the outcome, the outcome when done well, the when treatment goes to plan, um, makes no difference to the outcome long-term. And we know that there's plenty of literature on that. But maybe, you know, the, the important thing was, is because of the fragile nature of this lovely patient, she'd been through so much trauma. And we are sort of the last hope to make it happen for, you know, you're sort of the last Mohican trying yeah. to make it happen. and. And to hold this patient, and, and and Derek was all versed at all the you know all the stages. He knew exactly what was going on, and so I'm trying to build up this patient's confidence. It was the the biggest deal of the whole thing, you know, to build her up and maintain stability and comfort and aesthetics and function during the whole process. Process was extremely important. I mean, you, you saw uh, the patient a few times. I mean. To yeah. assess, make sure yeah. So we, so you mean first visit when we discuss options and stuff, she cried. Yeah. Second visit, she was really anxious. Again, she cried, and you know when I saw her for review after you'd done a lot of the work with Derek, um, she actually, um, I didn't do much. Uh, all the work was done by yourself. You and so? I'll, I'll, I'll prove you. 
I'll prove yeah, it. I, I was just the glorified plumber, just doing yeah. my job, a small part You'd be surprised how important your work is, and I'll come back to it later yeah, on. But she came and actually hugged me. You know, she was so happy, and she looked, she looked so stunning at the end of it. Like, you know, her smile was great. Uh, <laughs> Manny, while, while, you're discuss, while you're discussing things, that Luxa post, I think that's what you call it, Yes. I've seen amazing results with those cases we have, you know, with trauma, yeah, where yeah. we have that subgenital fracture, and I just need to do a little bit of extrusion so the dentist can prep the crown. Is yeah. that the same? Is that the same post? Yes, same one. Yes. You can bond. You can bond to the Luxa post Luxa core system, right. and that's what we did with Derek a lot of times when he was um, extruding trauma cases. Yeah. So yeah. I, in yeah. Our teeth, yeah. I, I strictly go for Luxa post, and a lot of posteriors, if they need a post, I. These days have reverted to Luxa post. Mm -hmm. Very, very unlikely I'll use a rigid post. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's mm -hmm. got to be a good reason. No, very enough. Well, we, we did the temporaries and uh, and uh, you can see the patient's confidence that the whole facial expression changes, doesn't it? It's so different. And then the uh, patient was uh, sent to Derek to proceed with the orthotic trip. Now, special place to crown a little bit of angle because that will have the bracket positioning so they can slightly talk. But before we start there, I can ask, we were concerned about the root field teeth, won't we? Uh, yeah. Right? Look, look the, the, deal, the deal with root field teeth, hmm. um, there's two schools of thought. And well, many is more up to date with the literature in this than I am. But the old way of thinking was if you had a root field tooth, you'd take out the... Um, uh, the gutta perca, you'd put calcium hydroxide in and only then would you start orthodontic tooth movement, right? Yeah. Um, but the more modern thought is if the root filling is done well uh, and the apical seal is good, then there's no contraindication to starting orthodontics. However, if you have a very dodgy root filling and every adult that comes to me for ortho that has, uh, can I say that word Russian root canal or is that going to offend people? Yeah, Russian red, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I can't possibly <laughs> even think about moving that tooth until Medi gives me a prognosis, you know. And many times Medi says, listen, that tooth's in the bin, in which case it's good to know that before I start orthodontics, so then I can close that space or at least give the patient choices. So here I was paranoid that I was going to move teeth that were already um, uh, root resorbed and, and may have had, uh, you know, a poor, in other words, one of the things we put on the table for her, which was very traumatic, was would this be a four implant case, uh, four upper anterior uh, implants, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, yeah, so it was really good to get Medi's uh, input and say, you know, look, proceed, but with light forces and with caution. And that's what we did. And, uh, you know, she's, she's very happy. Just so prior to the orthodontic phase here, I would have done a review. So the review is typically six months, guys. Um, I see obvious evidence of healing. And six, uh, fifty percent of cases completely heal, and that's when you've got less um, inflammation or cell uh, cells that may uh, predispose, like you know, with orthodontic and mild trauma, end up resorbing the root away. And again, as Derek said correctly, if you do a good quality root filling and you seal the top, that's better than any temporary during movement of ortho or orthodontic forces moving the teeth because things will leak. Every temporary leaks every band becomes loose, okay? And things start to leak. So the best is actually the permanent root filling um, and the core or seal over the top, not the crown. We put long-term temporary or lab-based crowns um, and we move the teeth and then following- Now this uh, is all done in the house. That I, I make my own temporaries up. Yeah, which is amazing. Like, so that, that's easy. Um, Derek can bond to it and move it, but I did review everything at six months. Yeah. Just because of the single visit, I didn't say start putting I just find that temperance. I notice, uh, I mean, from the static side, you can get some good temperance down in the mouth. You can use the compasses to improve the temperance as well, labelly. But maybe one thing that me and Derek did emphasize to the patient was the fact that we can't give 100% guarantee that these teeth will, will last or they will maintain. And during the process of the orthodontic treatment, will there be external resorption? mobility issues. I think we did mention that to the patient. Yes, yeah. So un un uncertain prognosis is what I tell the patient. Mm. I put all the options on the table, but she was really terrified of the implant, you know, the, the some implant supported prosthesis in the anterior region. So she was on, on our side, or at least on my side from day one. So I could say to her, 
from the beginning, I admit to it from the start, do not be upset at me if we, you know, you, you spend this time and money on these two teeth. And so we would have had a plan B if, if these two teeth did fail or a tooth fail. Um, but, I, you know, once I went in and transilluminated, uh, I, I was a lot more confident because we had enough thickness of dentine despite them gutting out tooth 1-1. One, one. There was still, luckily it was a 1-1 one, one and it wasn't a 1-2 or a 2-2 two, because two, then it's very thin or a low incisor. Those are quite thin by the time yeah. you cut them, you know, there's nothing left currently. Correct, correct, correct. Very good. So, Pesha went to Derek. And Derek, would you like to comment? Yeah, look, it, it, it was um, a fairly straightforward orthodontic case. Uh, I limited my forces using um, uh, what we call light force mechanics, so passive self ligation. Uh, so, you don't have to use O rings, which will increase the force and the um, uh, uh, binding and friction. So, we use a passive self ligation system. Um, uh, obviously, uh, I'm working with Sarkis as far as what's called, uh, am I using the right term, uh, Stephen Chu's gauges, tooth width to height proportion. Uh, and obviously, we want to make her huge looking centrals match her small looking laterals. Uh, and so it's so good for Sarkis to be able to give me something to work on to move. Because can you imagine if I'm uh, moving um, teeth that are different sizes and shapes, uh, it's like doing a jigsaw puzzle where I've borrowed bits of the jigsaw from other people's puzzle. I'm never going to get the end result. So when Sarkis gives me uh, something that's visual and the patient's happy with, then how easy it is for me to move the teeth? So that was an important part of the treatment. She also had occlusal canting. And so part of our intrusion mechanics was to level her occlusal canting by doing what we call intrusive mechanics uh, in quadrant two. And I just the crowns as time went by. Yeah. Maintain was in contact. This is at 12 months, Derek. I yeah. mean, uh, I mean, look, look, look how far we've become. You also did slight arch expression. I really like that fact that your slight arch expression that gives me less emphasis on the anterior aesthetics, you see. And with the arch expression, you have a beautiful arch. Look at that. I mean, so that looks really, really nice. And uh, then we do the lower, lower um, arch mechanics. Now, the interesting, the most important part of it, as you said, was the light forces because you don't want to get any root resorption here. Yeah. That was the biggest problem we had. And on, on, um, on that point of arch expansion, you know, many of my colleagues don't believe in expanding the arch unless there's a cross bite with a functional shift, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you, uh, when you look at buccal corridor width and what's called the uh, negative space, for a woman, in particular, uh, a woman of this age, the less you can, uh, so the more you can minimize her negative buccal coral Absolutely. space, the, the more happy she's going to look. And, you know, uh, you should have invited um, uh, Constantine uh, Abraham to talk on this one as well, because obviously her next step is going to be some uh, Botox on her lip uh, to uh, help her disguise some of that gummy smile. And he's very, very good on working with uh, the uh, post-treatment um, uh, facial aesthetics. Uh, but she's like a, she's a beautiful woman to begin with. But when you make that um, narrow arch just the right width, and remember, we're not pushing teeth out of the bone. We're using light forces and we're doing what's called frontal resorption, which means on the side of pressure and tension, we get new bone. So when you look at a CBCT at the end of treatment, you'll see those roots are perfectly upright, bone on either side, but a huge difference to um, her uh, buckle corridor allowing us to give a more of a smile arc maybe Sarkis you can talk a little bit about yeah I do, I do. Arc. yeah yeah uh, I think uh, one of the most important things to me was the asymmetric upper lip and it's, it's during small dynamics the, the lip rises and, uh, and 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 that was a concern for me and that was brought out to her prior so you know I was sort of we can do a lot of things but she chose at that time she wasn't worried about the lip, which is a great for us. I mean, that's a really important factor for me. But the other important thing was, as you're approaching to the final stage after four months, is I want to, we, we spoke about the restore design, and, uh, you know, we're doing the old uh, bridge work, which is uh, having a, a splint sensor, uh, having a pointing distally cantilever, is the wrong treatment, because I don't want to load those two centers. See, so if you're loading those two centers, then we actually, not doing the right things, they're very weak, they're structurally compromised. So to me, that was a key in planning and the patient couldn't understand, well, how are you gonna put a tooth at missing one, two, and two, two? 
well, this is where you're gonna think sometimes outside the box. And I like you to think in terms of, if you're thinking about doing implants here, provide you have adequate room, measure distally on both sides of the lateral splitting. And now, would you be keen enough to place uh, implants here? This is a very high angle maxilla, and the pre maxilla is very angled. And I'd like to invite speakers to talk about this later on. And Natasha, do take a note, because I'm gonna come back to it later on. But however, however, what I wanna do is that you can see how uh, Derek is intruding to Juan to bring it in, so because it's almost complete, the labially position before, and we are refining the palates of these uh, center incisors so they're not an inclusion. But the most importantly for me is that I'll be planning a Maryland's type of zirconia bonded bridge work to replace the central lateral incisors bilaterally. And therefore, we don't want to do too much reduction. We have adequate room here, okay, which then I can go ahead and place my creative canal guidance with my retainer of my resin water bridge work. So this is all planned before we start the treatment, not trying to work out what's after, okay? This is the beauty of having a multidisciplinary treatment planning with the patient because you can tell your orthodontist, well, I work with Derek basically exclusively in this area, and he knows exactly where it is. We read the same language. I think Derek, you and I should have a little video on how we can solve patients. That's really interesting to see but put things together pretty well. So having said that, yes, I've had adequate space. You can adjust as there's no trauma on those teeth. And naturally, uh, when we go to the next stage, we think about the inclusion prescription. I like to reduce any trauma on those teeth. I like to pick up the canine guidances. And during protrusive movement, I just want just general slide. So I want no forces. So just because you've been told anterior gardens, I don't want anterior gardens that can't help it, just a simple contact, because it does affect the loading on those two structurally compromised central incisors, okay? I want you to think what will happen if you lose 2-1 one or 1-1, one, one, okay? And how would you restore this aesthetically? Okay, so this is a key question. So I've got a question, Dr. Sarkis, uh, from someone. Um, they wanted to know why don't you consider um, extracting the 1-1 one, one and 2-1 and uh, doing a bridge? Okay, I'm going to answer that at the end of the, at the, at the end of the uh, lecture because uh, I want him to think and hopefully by the end of the lecture he will change his mind, but I'm, I'm most happy to discuss it. It's a really good question, okay? So the same place implants at 1-2 two, and 2-2 two, two, and extract those two and put a bridge. Fair enough, point taken. That's an interesting point. If, before I answer that question, look at, I want you to understand what happens when you lose tooth, especially in the pre-maxilla, which is anterior, on a high angle but producing case with a high smile and lip line, one wrappers around here, okay? And when do you lose these teeth, what happens in this area? You're gonna think sometimes the consequences, the consequences will be fit we should do. It's called feasibility study. I'll we'll come back in a minute. I will discuss it in a minute. So therefore, looking at all the different angles of our patient, okay? And I'm looking at the whole lip outline, uh, Derek may probably see that the uh, actual lip thickness improved immensely. And this is an important angle by simple orthodontic expansion. She looks really great. This is the angle people want, but this actually looks really good for this patient. Beautiful lips, okay? And you can see the whole thing just flows elegantly, okay? So this is, and the patient during this time is gaining immense confidence, immense confidence. I know we still have gum asymmetry present, but that's fine. There's ways of trying to resort that. So when we look at the situation, what I'm doing, I'm continuously assessing this is before natural on the right, and on the left, I'm continuously assessing the profile. You get the lip thickness of the same smile, eyes a lot more thicker during full smile, okay? And uh, you can see later on, we're gonna improve on this as well. So a bit of expansion, reduce the maxial labial folds at age of 35, she will have less folds and she will probably reduce the rate of aging of the facial age. She also has a very uh, healthy uh, diet and good healthy living. However, finally, finally, uh, we decide that uh, <clears throat> we slowly coming to the end of the treatment and uh, you know, recessing and it's just fine. And you can see it's all lined up. Uh, we didn't want to proceed anymore here because we thought it's enough that this tooth is very weak structurally any more pressure, then trying to move this into more measurely. 
would cause other deleterious effect. So I looked at the risk benefit ratio. We thought the benefit of leaving the tooth in this position or this particular situation is outweighs the risks of losing this tooth. And that's a very important thing to consider. Okay, naturally for me was to improve the papillary formation, okay, which I could do with the new temporaries and improve the distal papillary formation. And this is an important part. So this is a very complex study. As you can see in the smile on the right side, the full upper lower teeth are on the show, high angle mandible, the tendency to open bite. That's why you can see directly in light forces. So there's a reduction in anterior open bite formation. And I think that's something that they will mention later on. Nevertheless, their name was to create that, but we maintain somewhere in between for this patient. Uh, Derek, would you like to comment so far before I go to the next stage? Yeah, no, just uh, she was a difficult orthodontic case, even though it didn't look very crowded. A, because of her bidental incisive protrusion, and B, because of her dolicofacial profile. So all our mechanics were molar intrusion. Mm -hmm. um, so as you intrude the molar, you close the wedge down. Uh, yeah. And at the same time, uh, we had to detalk the incisors and uh, a little bit of IPS involved in that. Uh, remember, if you have a patient who's bidental incisive protrusive like that, yeah. you have to really upright the lowers to give you room to detalk the uppers. Um, and that was achieved um, using a prescription, which is what we call super low talk. Uh, so yeah, a little bit of planning gone into getting that um, uh, Biden and Shrewsbury back. And when you look at her end results, which Sarkis will show soon, you'll see how much uh, easier it is for her, her lip drape uh, to get good uh, lip competence than compared to... I mean, I was just looking you know. over here, Derek. I mean, yeah. isn't this marvellous? Look at that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at that. I mean, uh, no filler <laughs> to give you this effect. Okay, the simple arch expansion, right, lifts up the muscles of facial expression, right? And when she smiles, there's an extra lip if you're improving the scaffolding of a mid face. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the, it's the ultimate for aesthetics. In a maxilla development, most of the efficiency is a bit pain, isn't it, really, when you think about it, most of the efficiency. So anyway, we're going to the next stage. So here we are. So we finally thought that it's time. So uh, new temporaries um, and change the smile line slightly. You can see totally transformed patients still have discoloration of pervert, uh, you know, uh, we had to do still some work and there's slight gum asymmetry. The name of the game is a developed papilla, a lot of papilla development. Now it's possible for every patient. So it takes a bit of time. Uh, but the problem is here, because we couldn't move the 2 1, we have a problem here on the right side. And I will show you in this picture that's a problem. So here we are with everything right. Uh, we had to accept this compromise. The patient understood that. But we try to have a few more tricks in our book. So I'd like to be able to see if we can bring this back down as far as we can. And uh, uh, I was uh, about 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, we uh, listened to Dennis Tarno speak. And uh, I was uh, listening to Garber speak, where they talk about the central semilunar advanced on flaps. They make a little flap here, okay? And then you just bring this flap down you can use tissue adhesives to just glue it down as far as you can. It tends to work. Naturally, uh, we like to do, um, uh, there's another technique which we can do, and I'll show you that later on, but here's the issue that we need to fix up, okay? Because if you don't get this right, the whole case fails. And, uh, you know, the, the onus is now on me, the pressure on me to get this right. And uh, when you think about it a bit more, although with time and uh, there's, a, you know, there's a gum maturation, you can see that we do some assessment, Suddenly, for some reason, I give the patient a more lip exercise, and you can see the left lip is not rising as much because the patient understands that if they smile in front of a mirror and maintain it, you can actually improve their lips. So there's a number of issues we have here. Meantime, we try to improve our temperatures, try to get into papillary, uh, in a papilla formation with this patient. So the, the, the surgery we did was not the same as pinup prior surgery, maybe like pinup surgery, we kind of bring it down. Today, this is what I do. But mostly it was like a little semilunar attachment, uh, the similar surgery, where I cut the gum. You can see just the scar formation and bring that down. And that's healing now. We're going to give it time to heal. And this is two weeks with the temporaries. You get a gum formation, starts to some redness here. Okay, we'd like to see that really improve. Uh, and uh, at the same time as redness, we have developed our, uh, you know, ovate pontic formation here. You can see I improved the gum line with ovate pontic. So there's 
A lot of these are happening at the same time for this patient. I'm proving the gum symmetry that makes this less obvious and makes overall symmetry less obvious, especially raising the gum level here. The lip asymmetry becomes less obvious because you got more tooth showing on the left side. Again, two weeks, it's coming better. It's getting better. We're getting pink gum formation. This is getting pink. And again, we maintain four weeks and keep going after four weeks with a temporary. Uh, this is six weeks post-op. Uh, you know, that looks a bit better as she's brushing. And you can see she's happy. I mean, it's so nice to hold, carry our patients and maintain that confidence that they feel that treatment is going well and naturally be able to, uh, you know, to be able to deliver the treatment. This is 12 weeks post-op and I feel we have achieved gum symmetry and I can improve the tooth symmetry, a bit more particular growth here, which will present the patients. But all that time, during these 12 weeks, in my mind, I'm thinking of different effects, different angles. What do I do? What's the smile line? How do I create that special effect? So this is a very common, because I'm very visual, you see. I like to see things visually and leave to be teach at the college. See, a lot of the time that people do courses, you can't have time to develop that visual assessment. You know, the old saying, what the eye cannot see, the mind cannot recognize, is so true. We teach you what to see. We teach you by seeing, you recognize, and that's the important part of that important aesthetic perception that we like to profess to our students in the college that we teach. So finally, we got 12 weeks. And you can see we have always pontic, that's very natural. Patient can maintain good oral hygiene here, and that's so as well. We're improving the actual papillary development. That doesn't look too bad here. Okay, I'd like to get a bit more. I'd like to get a bit more if I can. Hopefully we can later on. But that's not too bad for me to proceed with a final restoration. There's a good maturation. I'd like to wait a bit longer, I'd probably like to wait six months, but I think there's a patient where I factor and she's improved overall. I think Derek's done a marvelous job. I mean, looking at the, the position of the upper arch, you could have the lip drapes on the lower arch, it's so symmetrical. So we, we um, you know, we use the uh, bracket positioning uh, set up by uh, Dr. Tom Pitts, where you actually bracket based on the lower lip. In the old days, when I learned orthodontics, um, we would bracket off the incisal edge and everyone ended up with like a denture smile, right? right? Nowadays, we look at the lower lip and we put our brackets to to compensate that. The other thing is, Sarkis, can you just show the buckle segment in the digitation uh, from one of your previous slides? Um, she initially wanted Invisalign, right? Um, yeah. And uh, just, just so I can see right or left um, buckle segment yeah. softening. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, no, so go the slide before, the one you had. Yeah, that's it. You, you can't really, I don't care what anyone tells you, you can't achieve that socked in buckle segment occlusion with mm. a liner over a liner. I mean, you can do it post aligner therapy with some settling and things like that. But if you really want to sock in an occlusion like that and detalk in sizes, um, you know, nothing big's fixed braces. Now, I've done similar cases with you, Sarkis, using yeah. clear aligners. Um, and it's almost like, uh, I don't know, taking your clothes down to the Ganges and washing them with uh, uh, some hand soap as opposed to shoving them in an automated machine. And you know what I mean? Yeah. So luckily she was sensible enough that she realized that benefit because I've been, and you know, both of you and I have had those cases who want aligners only, but want these uh, amazing results. So just, just that's my orthodontic input for what it's worth. No, absolutely. 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 And, uh, so we in this position, so basically we have always pointed that looks right, we have achieved symmetry. And I think you saw this patient a couple of times and so what do you think? And you were happy. Uh, so we're now in a position to go to restorative phase and actually you can see the, the always pointing has developed as a gum defect, it's feeling a bit better now. Scar is almost gone here. And uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, just to let you know, there's no Photoshop in my images. What you see is what you get. Uh, I don't have time to follow it, I just want to take some good photos, and that's the main thing. Uh, and we teach the how to is specially detailed, the emergence profile. This is the copy in the final restoration. There's a lot of tricks in the books, how do we copy this in the final restoration? And, and uh, that's really crucial that we get that right, because if you don't get that right, then you destroy the whole work. Now, those of you who are asking me about uh, what you can see doing implants here and here, and take those teeth out, you have a high smile line. If I take those two teeth out, 
I can show you, you're gonna, you're gonna lose this papilla, it's gone. You're gonna lose this papilla, that's gone, okay? You have a defect going from here, there, 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 there. There's no way in the world, in the highest smile, are you gonna restore aesthetics. As a matter of fact, these two teeth are the key teeth. And I, maybe, let me tell you, you, you saved the day. <laughs> yeah, I still I still remember you telling me that because I was like, oh gee, you oh, saved the day. Better, better teeth be extracted. So I was like, are you sure? You're like, no man, you're saving it. You're saving it. And I was really um, I mean, you know, now I can see what you're talking about. Back then, I was like, why are you like, you know, hanging on to these teeth and yeah, pushing? You the day. You know, they might crack. You know, the, endodontically, they're not the best teeth. You know, they've they've lost their natural anatomy, especially mm. the two one. They gutted out the one one. Anyway, I'm really happy that you showed this you result. You saved the day, and 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 this is talks about tooth conservation. Imagine, I'll show you. I can show you later on when patients have unnecessary teeth removed, and you place your implants here at the angled cases with the maxilla, and you're going to have that implant virtually coming out, and you're looking whole gray area that can't be fixed. So major issue. So I wouldn't consider doing implants because patients grow. The liquid facial patients grow. They grow longer, longer. In their face. So as they grow longer, the maxilla is at an angle. So maxilla grows forward and down. So implants are going to be on the surface. So I would never, even if I had perfect teeth here, space missing, never in the high smile cases do implants. Impossible. I just won't do it because the risks are too high. I can't control the other side. So there's a treatment for this. And the treatment naturally is about thinking about developing the emergence profile is my temporary. Now use my temporary to develop the emergence profile. Now you cannot tell the patient, oh, the final works are going to be really good. Don't worry about my temporaries. It's your temporaries that gives the patients the confidence. It's how good you as a practitioner to take your time. Not let the laboratory make temporaries. You're going to make this yourself. This is a this is a on the chase side situation. Look at the smile line. So if you take those those sensors out the other one, we can have a defect not just from this end. Not just this end. You can have a defect that's in three days. We block. She's gonna drop her upper lip right down. This is like an end block of bone missing in the anterior area. So how are you gonna fix that? Impossible. I see cases that's been done, and we don't know how to fix these problems. You can't grow bone vertically and at an angle. We can grow bone horizontally. Vertical maximum is about four millimeters. Okay, horizontally you can grow bone. But here, you lose all that bone. For the sake of, I want to put in bone. Well, the answer is no. The important part is to understand. Understand that what are the consequences of our treatment plan? This is why we like to simplify things. Respect biology. Respecting biology is the key. What the most important thing is that biology derives restorative outcome, okay? Not the implant company. Not the implant reps who come and tell you how to put a implant in the bone, but it's actually biology. This is what we doctors. This is what we teach at the college. How to think, how to diagnose. But nevertheless, here's a temporary. That's another angle of temporary. Having the lip support, okay, speech, assessment. There's always room to improve. Okay, here's another temporary. And look at the whole patient, okay? The whole patient in terms of, you know, how do we plan our aesthetics? How do you create that special look that this complements the patient? Not having a confident patient. Then the technician has got time to make that right, you know, effect of uh, creating the restoration because I designed the restorations with my technician, been there for a long time. The lid, look at that, the way the settles are, they come in, they just drape behind the wet dry line, vermilion border, and that's aesthetics. A lot of you think when you do this digital smile design, which I don't really like, and I've made it very clear in many ways, I don't care who's what, is that aesthetics is not mathematics. Dear colleagues, aesthetics is biology, and biology is chaos. Okay? So you want to do aesthetics, you have to go chaos, control chaos. That's what we do every day, I'm sure. And then they'll go to the next stage. So from here, it's very simple. It's very simple. As a matter of fact, we do simple, uh, like little lines. We're looking at 0.5 millimeters here. And you can see the pontic there, the elbow pontic development. And we design our restorations that replace the lateral incisor 
is uh, in this case, I use the coin of crowns, I'm afraid, maybe. Really. No, it's all good. Anterior okay. spleen. The yeah. coin of my anterior is no issue. Yeah. Posterior, I've got an issue with exactly. the There's no contact on the anterior. Of course, your prescription is not quite. There's room to move. It's all designed. You can see how it's sitting there very nice and fitting around the, the canines. That creates my canine stops and canine guidance. That's an important part of the design of the recession. All the guidance is on the retainer, which is just sitting on the canine, not in a ponty. And uh, having said that, uh, we go next day, we just try to see how it looks and try to see the whole mouth. And, and naturally, I love being a bit more creative. He's a uh, Final restorations at a different angle. And you can see we have a beautiful emergence profile. Uh, and uh, we did, we could have done the veneer here, which I prefer, but at this stage, was a, a, we can come back to it later on. I give that option to the patient. How it's copying the final restorations, so I dress around the lip, is a smile line. It all seems to sort of flow. And this is all about creating flow. Aesthetics is not mathematics. Besides biology and chaos, is creating flow and dynamics. That's what the status is. is. Has to look good in all angles, not just one angle that pleases you or the patient. Because other people looking at the patient too and they're off guard. And again, looking before, after 18 months. This is before treatment and we have after treatment. Okay. I mean, this is what we want. Naturally, we like to grow more popular, but this is where the retainer comes into play. That's where we have to stop right here. Gums are more level here, so retainers here. We need the thickness of the retainer to design that. Okay, they have restorations. But again, it's designed like the veneer here, that can be done later on. But nevertheless, from the looking more closer on the sagittal angle, here's a provisional restorations and here's other definite restorations for this patient. And again, maintaining all the important areas of knots. So when we think about biology, we have to, and the treatment planning, we have to understand how do we put the whole jigsaw puzzle together? How do we go to our colleagues for their opinions and to see, well, you know what? Uh, I really need help here. What do you, what do you think of the, 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 the one, one and two, one? How can we sort this out? What's the prognosis? And patients really well informed. And, you know, you can see the patient here lack of confidence, but plenty of confidence. And she's got perfect lip support. This is at rest, you know, got a complex smile line, biomax, high angle. It looks really good. Not because of one person, but three people got there. And naturally you can see there's less, lesser facial force than the level groups, or because Derek managed to put the arch in the right place. Uh, maybe the his work will give me the foundation I was comfortable with and to main biology, which is the digital margins and the bone, that that bone, that's important bone, maybe that holds the lip together. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if the whole thing is a failure. Okay. The whole thing is a failure. Patient does not use those two front teeth to buy anything out. That's the deal. There's, there's no plan B. <laughs> we don't have a plan B. Okay. And naturally, you let this patient smile, and that's aesthetics because we've taken on board all the important biological principles that governs function, comfort, in this case, normative needs, and aesthetics. And this is definite restoration, and we have a very confident patient. Well, I guess the final image will say more than a thousand words because. Here's a patient when she started, and here's a patient afterwards. Any questions so far? Well, before you think about questions, the most important thing when you treatment sequence in managing our patients is that wise people also know how to plan for results and not for procedures. This is the motto of our college education, rcodp.com, because we plan for results. And having said that, that brings me to the questions that you may wish to ask me. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And again, I want to thank Mehdi and Derek 
for being part of this important case. And we have many cases on the table. And I'm sure they're going to ask me questions about the other case we have on the table at the moment. But so forth. So any questions for the college or any questions for this case you have? Natasha, are you there? Mm -hmm. I'm just waiting on. There's a question and answer section if people wanted to post their questions. Oh, absolutely. I'm happy to. So you're running the questions, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more happy to answer them. And by all means. Um, there was actually a question before about when you asked about why we thought that um, the old work that was done failed was material choice and the teeth being root canal treated but incomplete in the past a consideration okay let me go back to that the first opg that mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. i'll come to that thank you you're coming to you're coming to almost there here correct mm -hmm. Without so, the question? yeah yeah okay. The reason uh, teeth failed was a uh, number of fault. First of all, there was inadequate retention resistance. Second, there was occlusion and the import, just a poor design of the whole thing because in a way we should thank the fact that it kept on dislodging because if they had tried to really create the effect, whatever they did, that would have caused a root fracture or a core fracture that would be unrestorable. So sometimes Yay. it's a blessing. Would that be correct, Mehdi? Yeah. Yes, but remember, just remember, not only the bonding would have been better than fracture because um, one one was quite bored out. Um, so we're lucky it didn't fracture. That's right. So it's a blessing. Seclusion. Next question, Natasha. We also replaced these crowns too, so he's all replaced. Any other? I mean, peri had to be fixed up here because you can see there's an area of peri problem. So that was all fixed up here. Another question was, what materials did you do your crowns with? In this case, I used the cornea for the anterior teeth. Uh, I couldn't do uh, metal ceramic, which is always my favorite. The reason, because technician couldn't quite match it, and only for that reason only. My favorite would have been metal ceramic with about uh, three, three millimeters of evil margins going straight up and grabbing our boots. That would be my favorite. But in this case, we had to sacrifice the aesthetic thing. Um, in and, the right um, bite, zirconia is fine. Um, um, yeah, yeah, Derek is, Derek is um, in, you know, corrected the bite, so it shouldn't be an issue there, right? So, no, no issue, no issue, because there's no contact on the anterior, there's actually open contact. Yeah. The only contact she will have is on canines, and she arrives back and forth on the canines, so it's, it's been designed that way. So, crucial prescription is extremely important in this case. Um, there's another question, and this is for Dr. Mahoney how predictable. Um, is it to move these teeth with crowns, with fixed or aligners? Um, so Sarkis changed the crowns to a material I could bond to. That was the tip there. Um, it's very hard for me to bond to all like porcelain, particularly um, Sarkis. I, I'm a, a mere orthodontist, so I don't know <laughs> what bloody materials you have these days. But there's I, one yeah. there's one porcelain that's a bitch to bond to. Um, can you give me that name? It's uh, if you tell me the name, I'll remember it. Well, uh, also, look, uh, look, it's I a really strong, it's really, really strong, and everyone loves it. But my god, it's very hard to bond to. Okay. You know, okay, you probably, look, they're all easy to bond, but the one you probably think of is the old VMKs when the glassy face is gone, the yeah. underneath the opaque layer just can't bond to it, right? Right, okay. But uh, the other portion is a uh, very heavily. Hello. It's an Emax type of Emax. Oh, Emax, Emax, sorry, Emax. That's it, Emax. So, you know, when I have someone who's had newly placed crowns, it's a nightmare for me. Um, in this case, we had agreed the crown was going to be replaced. So it made sense for Sarkis to replace what she had as something I could bond to. And for an orthodontist, bonding to composite is very, very easy. You don't get bond failure. In the old days, when I graduated, we would put stainless steel bands around all these teeth. So you didn't worry, right? But obviously, a young lady like this, the last thing he wants to know is to look like, uh, what's that, ugly Betty um, uh, during, her, uh, during her orthodontics. Yeah. So in answer to the question, I think I'm hearing this right. Um, we, we bonded to what Sarkis had created for me. Um, uh, that was important. And then throughout treatment, he was constantly refining 
the size and shape of teeth until we got it all right with smile arc, buccal corridor, talk of incisors, et cetera. So when the braces came off, then of course he was able to replace his temporary stuff with uh, more high-end aesthetic uh, things. And that's, uh, uh, you know, and she's a very, very happy patient. She, uh, I saw for a retainer review the other day, Sarkis, and she yeah. said she can't, she can't go past a mirror without <laughs> looking at her face and smiling. Isn't that amazing? She has a very, very beautiful. Yeah, day. yeah. Beautiful. Even I got a hug out of that one. Thanks, yeah. guys. I never get a hug. I'm not important. <laughs> <laughs> you guys always get Just a hug. Just to answer it. Uh, Just uh, another Natasha, question. Natasha, one second. Natasha, one second, my dear. Sure. Uh, we need to have a provisional crown, which is made from Luxotank, and, and, and there's a way to do it. We teach them at the college how to do it. It's very hard to, uh, to refine these uh, metal ceramic crowns or it's just impossible to do it. So I will have provisional crowns no matter what. And uh, and uh, if these provisional crowns are, when Derek talks them starting in, and if they come in contact, there's more chance of fracture pain. So the, the temporary crown is softer to the bite. So there's no way I'll have this back in the mouth. I'll just have the temporary crowns while Derek's doing his work and while maybe he's doing his own work. What's the next question? Um, so what temporary cement did you use to ensure that the provisionals didn't debone? Over yeah. non I have adequate resistance and retention. So maybe create a good core, which I'll refine slightly. I'm happy. So, you know, in the anterior, you don't need, uh, you know, there's a, there was adequate tooth and core and foundation to support the temporary. They actually um, have not temporary. Um, just another question. Um, what if the um, crowns fail, the ones that you put through, what would your next plan of action be? That's a hard one, but thank you for the question. You know, I just hope that this doesn't happen as long as possible. But if they fail, uh, I think a 2 1 will fail before anything else. And if it does fail, then I have to consider uh, doing other forms of treatment. So implants won't be my first choice. I have to think of other ways of doing it. If I was doing an implant, it would be a very narrow platform implants, very narrow platform, uh, post possibly coaxial type implants. So that, uh, and, uh, and I will consider quite a bit of grafting to uh, reduce uh, labial resorption using a slow, um, slow resorbing bone substitute. That would be one of the options I would consider. So uh, in this case, if you're going to lose it, uh, I would graft two one immediately and uh, overgraft the area and try to maintain what I have. I will still use a uh, provisional restorations to create the papillary formation while healing is taking effect. I will wait for six to nine months at least to lie the graft. I would not do immediate implant placement and I'll tell you why. So those of you who can see over here, that, that, that brings my final question. This is a, like a, it's like a, uh, uh, what you could like a basket type of, uh, you know, uh, alveolus formation. So once you lose these and you just lose all that bone. So the bone, you could lose about this much, it's gone. So from here, you have a huge defect of feel. There's a big, big defect going like that. And with a high smile line, you have this patient with a high smile line, where is she? I mean, can you imagine, that's not high enough by the way. There's a huge defect. I mean, where's another smile? Let me show you, look here. Where she, she's talking, look. I mean, look at the smile. Okay, just imagine, you're gonna lose all that bone. There's a deficiency already, okay? Her lips gonna fail. I mean, you will age this lady immediately. So uh, it's a wrong treatment. I mean, I, I don't wanna see plan B. I've made that very clear to the patient and she's very careful. I mean, just, you know, will it happen? Maybe, you know? I've got another question. Does food get stuck under the laterals? No, not at all. Okay. She, just, she was here yesterday, actually, for hygiene. I said to her, you're going on webinars, so you can't wait. So, uh, no. Actually, my heart didn't um, answer that question if she's, on, she's there. But you saw this patient, too, didn't you? Yeah, I, I have seen him from start to finish, actually. It was quite good. Yeah. So just one, one more question, Dr. Sarkis. Um, mm -hmm. Would you ever have considered orthodontically moving the one, three, and two, three mesially, lateralizing, and then implants in one, three, two, three side? This may be an option for the future long term risk of loss of one, one, two, one. Okay. okay. I understand the question. Well, I, I think uh, 
I'll give you my opinion, but I will ask Derek to come in. If you're gonna, you're saying you move one three to two this position, and that one to that position, okay, and uh, placing implants here. Well, that would be an option, okay. But I think uh, from the idea of bring that forward there, okay. Look, it's a certainly a possibility, but it will take a long time, okay, a long time. Uh, that will be uh, next option. It's not a bad idea, but uh, Derek, what would your thought be on this? Well, look, number one, you know, um, the anchorage would be very difficult because her central incisors um, already have a poor prognosis. So can you imagine using those as anchorage to drag the canines measly? It just, it would put them in the bucket. The only way you'd be able to bring the canines mesial uh, uh, and make them, what's it called? Lateralization yeah. uh, would be with skeletal anchors. So not even TADS. TADS would fall out in her case because of the bone that she has there. You'd need a MaxFac surgeon to put a bone plate um, up above the centrals and then you'd need to use that. But my God, you're talking about the orthodontics going from less than a year to maybe two and a half years, right? So although it is feasible, is it practical? Um, uh, and then, of course, you need a very skilled uh, uh, combination of making the uh, canine look like a lateral because that's a bulbous tooth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then you've got the premolar, which you'd have to intrude to give the canine gingival margin uh, to match the canine because the premolar is uh, much smaller and the gingival margin is lower than the canine. So it is possible, but my God, we're, we're talking about um, uh, difficult orthodontics. You know, uh, I wouldn't rule it out. For instance, if, um, if uh, Mehdi had come back uh, and said, look, those central incisors need to go in the bin, then we need to think about something else. But when you look at her um, facial type, when you look at the width of her smile, I just think this is the best result for her. I'm not saying it's not possible, uh, but what is theoretically possible from a textbook uh, is not always practically possible. I've been moving teeth for 35 years. And let me tell you, asking someone to move the uh, canine measly, then the premolar, then a second, then it's a lot of orthodontics. And I, I think you get patient burnout and possibly uh, more chance of root resorption on those teeth. I think uh, the important part, Derek, is that we, we, need, we, need to, we need to plan we need to plan for results, you know? We need to plan for results. It shouldn't be just simply thinking what's the right. And implant is not the answer. I mean, I would try to avoid implant at all costs. In, in the, look at the angle here. Look at how I angle it. I mean, you place the implant, where are you going to put it? About here, and the lip goes up, you start losing bone with physical premaxillary remodels. That grade is going to come through. You're going to fix it. Who's going to fix it? I can't fix it. Okay. I mean, you lose those two teeth, you lose your lips. I have a problem with that. At least you're giving the patient an option to get on with the life and then at least have the benefit of having what we have. And then naturally, there'll be more treatments. Who said that when you place the implants more long-term definite treatment? Who knows that? Who knows that? We don't know. And in, in hindsight, when this young lady who, I believe, Saka, she's from Mexico, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I believe when she was a child and they realized she was missing laterals, what they should have done is extracted the bees really early in life mm -hmm. and let the canine erupt next to the central. So then you'd have one, three, and C. Does that make sense? And that way you have all your options open because if you're going to put implants in, you could take the C out when she's old enough for implants, distalize the canine. And as you distalize the canine, new bone is on the mesial, <coughs> which is perfect bone for an implant. Or if you're going to make the uh, canine look like a lateral, you have minimal orthodontics because the canine's erupted there. So unfortunately, I think she's not been given correct diagnosis as a kid. Uh, and they've just assumed that uh, she would need implants uh, and, and given her some temporary bridges that didn't work. So I think, um, uh, case in point, if you have a patient who's missing laterals, it's really important to multidisciplinary plan that. And if you are planning to put implants in, possibly defer your implants until the patient's, um, sorry, defer your orthodontics until the patient's old enough for implant uh, uh, therapy. I, I remember, Derek, 
the famous lecture given by Vince Cottage. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, on this, and I was in uh, I was in uh, uh, Puerto Rico Hotel Cristado, El Cristado, and I met him for the first time in '97. Uh, he gave a lecture, a really good lecture, with him and uh, Spear, Frank Spear. That was a very good lecture. That just brings so much memories back. Uh, it's sort of changed, but I think uh, we need to plan for results, and we need to maintain the security as much as we can. And uh, so far. So good. I mean, can we say what will happen in the future? There's another the, sort of this thing in my, my own mind is moving the canine in. If one day that becomes an option, you'll have to cut away a lot of the canine, as Derek said. And the other thing is because of the gummy smile, you aren't going to end up with a black triangle because you're never going to get the ginger mar gingival margin right, mesial distal width and the amount of removal you do. It'll be very hard, wouldn't it? To make it look like a true lateral, you're losing. You lo you lose those teeth. You lose your lips. Yeah. So you tell a woman, any woman, how important is the thickness of your upper lip? They'll give you an answer. Okay. 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 And Natasha, am I correct? Yeah. Thank you. No, I, I, mean, I just from um, a female point of view that the upper front teeth will hold the lips. This is important. It's very important. Any questions? Any other questions coming in, Natasha? Mm, I haven't got any other ones. If anyone's got them, you can pop them on. But no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, having said that, well, thank you all for joining us. And um, it's been wonderful to... I've actually got a question. Go um, with, and this is still at the college. Uh, do you have a specific target audience in mind when the college was written? Of course. Well, of course we have. We like to have uh, maximum 25 students because that gives me enough time to teach and me on a personal level of students. I think performance is an art form and, uh, and science and art combined together and uh, people need the mentoring and that's a really important part of it. So I think for any one year, 25 is a maximum number that we can take to be able to to teach and spend that quality time in mentoring. I think that's important. Uh, it's a lot of work. I mean, uh, it's a lot of work on my behalf and on my colleagues' behalf and the faculty behalf. So at the end of the day, students will achieve, I think, um, confidence and skills, not just treatment, but also how to talk to the patient, how to manage the patient. Uh, it, it's the psychology of getting um, patient report and uh, giving that nice atmosphere that patient feels very comfortable. I said, doctor, I trust you. Just do what you're gonna do. And that reduces the, any pressure from the fees that you present uh, because the trust factor is there because you've got the knowledge and the confidence and know-how. I mean, that's one of the important things that we teach at the college. It's not about recipe or a procedure. Uh, you know, you can create your own recipes. The college will give you your own uniqueness to create your own style, but diagnosis and trip and plan. There's only one diagnosis, many words of trip, trip, trip and plan, but learning how to diagnose. I mean, uh, I spent a few years with Derek and working a lot of patients. I learned a lot about the way Derek thinks, I learned many things. I learned a lot about the way uh, the, the periodontist thing, because you're thinking of different areas and everyone's got huge knowledge and compounding knowledge, you know. We're talking about feasibility. What feasibility is, is about if you know you do this person, you're going to get that. And, and knowledge is compounded because, you know, people say, I'm doing implants. Well, you know, I've done over 5,000 implants, over 1,000 patients. I just know which way this case is going to go because I understand growth of the face, the bone resorption factors. I understand all these things. So we plan. We like to challenge our students because when you get challenged, that's when you learn, not when you, uh, you know, put a person in the face and say, look at my work. That doesn't mean much. And then you will impress me more by showing me how passionate you are about dentistry. And that's really important to know. Anything else I can do, Natasha? Um, I just wanted to say That's, that college is there. Those are the only questions I've got so far. So if anyone's got any other questions, you can email us at education at icodp.com. I've popped in that on the chat as well for everyone. Well, we're getting the numbers coming through the college. So 
you're most welcome. There's a few remaining, but uh, we feel that we're about to start the course very, very soon. And thank you all for attending. And I hope this has been informative for you. And uh, if there's any questions you feel, you can always write to Natasha and, uh, and uh, she'll be more than happy to help. Is there any other questions before we call it a day? Now I think we're good so far. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank coming. you, everyone. Derek, Medi, thank you so much. Thanks, Arcus. Thank you. Great, uh, great, great learning platform for uh, doctors. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thanks for being part of the college. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Bye. See you then. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Just don't log out as yet, please. Okay. I'm just replying to some messages. Sure. Dr. Sarkis, I think there is a question. There was another question regarding the cost. Yeah, I've just replied. Okay. Very interesting, Sarkis. <laughs> From an artistic point of view. <laughs> oh, hi, Linda. How are you, Natasha? Good, how are you? Not bad, <laughs> Well, I've just got some nice comments. Thank you all. It's good. There's a lot of comments that are coming in. Well, it's all about... I like you. Yeah. Sorry, I was saying the best part I like is about the aesthetics, the flow and balance. That's right. Well, you're a musician. You're not bad, don't you? No, it's just interesting. I'm happy to answer any questions, but that should be coming through. I'm just um, replying to the course start dates. Sure, sure. So the course actually starts 7th of August. Mm -hmm. and that's for the first hands-on learning session. Oh, that's an incredible day. I think um, we can, oh, there's still some comments going on. Okay. I'll just grab a word. I think we're good, Kevin. Yep, that's it. Can we? Yeah. Dr. Sarkis will have to end the meeting. Okay, you're ending or I'm ending? You have to no, end it. You will have to end it. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you all. I'll see you soon, Linda. Bye, Sarkis. I'll see you. you. It's one quick picture, so nice pose. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Hold on. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, bye. bye, guys. Thanks, Natasha.